Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the weekly briefing brought to you by the Executive Policy Group of the Emergency Leadership Team. I'm Dr. Ruth Jackson, Vice President for Academic Affairs, and I'm joined by fellow members of the EPG, Mrs. Teresa Powell, Chief of Staff in the Office of the President, Dean Joshua Snavely, Dean of the School of Business, Chief Mario Holland, Langston University Police Department, and Dean Joshua Busby, Dean of, School, Dean of Student Affairs. In today's webinar, we will provide the COVID-19 status update. We'll also discuss the expanded testing protocols. We'll have an overview of the ClearSpan communicator application that we're very excited about. I'll review important upcoming dates. And as always, we'll end by reflecting on resilience. This time I'll ask Mrs. Powell to provide the update for COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. So as we do every week, we want to share an update on where we stand on the case count for um, the state of Oklahoma, the local county here of Logan County, where the, the Langston campus is located, and also the university community as a whole, which includes all of our university campuses and sites. So as you'll see on the slide, um, we have seen an increase in the total cases for the state of Oklahoma. Uh, that's a weekly increase. So we're bringing these numbers to you each Monday and you'll see the increase um, from last Monday to this Monday of 9.8% in total cases. The active cases have also increased by 10.8% and we've seen a consistent increase as well in the deaths around the state of Oklahoma. For the county of Logan County, where again the Langston campus is located, we are seeing an increase in the total case numbers for the county. We're also seeing a slight increase in the active case numbers. We were holding steady for some time, but we have seen that increase over this week, um, again due to some of the gatherings um, that occur throughout this holiday season. And we have unfortunately seen an increase in the number of deaths within the county of Logan County. For the university community as a whole, again, this includes all locations, all campuses, and all sites of the university. We have 73 total cases. Seven of those cases are active. So we, we currently have seven active cases. This could be a combination of all faculty, staff, and students, but we do have seven active cases for the university as a whole. Next, we're going to share um, some updates that we presented last week concerning our Protect the Pride plan. Um, we shared last week that we are developing some updates to the plan, which we will be releasing in the new year. We held back some updates that we had planned to bring to you just before Thanksgiving due to some of the concerns that we had regarding gatherings, private gatherings, um, because we anticipated and, and did see a rise in the case numbers due to those gatherings. And we anticipate that the same will be the case for the holiday gatherings as well as we enter the holiday season. So we're holding steady with our, the updates that we are preparing for the plan and want to be able to release those at a time where we can see a little bit more consistency with the cases as we return from the break. Um, so as we released on our webinar last week, we are going to move forward in presenting a more layered strategy with our testing. We have expanded our, expanded our testing protocols. Those will be articulated in the plan that is forthcoming in the new year. This will be a multifaceted approach where we are testing upon arrival to the campus. We'll also be testing certain student groups that we'll describe those in just a moment. And we'll be doing some surveillance testing. Surveillance testing as described and defined by the CDC is a strategy wherein we will be testing um, different populations, whether that be a certain uh, residential housing complex or a certain student population, we will be testing that specific population to get an understanding of the risk for an outbreak based on some population demographics and uh, 
some, some statistics we'll be following based on that surveillance. So that's forthcoming in the new plan as well. Some more information to bring you regarding the expanded testing. This is some more details that we again shared last week um, at our webinar. So releasing to releasing this plan to you on uh, when we return to campus on June 4th. But as of June 1st, 2021, you will see some expanded testing protocols, which include initial testing upon return to campus for all students. This will be required. We're going to be asking students to submit some testing in advance and have some testing that they will complete when they return to campus. We'll be doing routine testing that could include a variety of groups that would be together during the spring semester. This could include student athletes where social distancing is impossible or impractical. Um, also, possibly some music ensembles will be uh, rolling out that testing in the spring semester as well. And we will be offering some optional weekly testing for students and university employees. So in addition to the surveillance testing that we described last week, we'll also be doing some optional weekly testing that will be available to the university community. And now I will ask uh, Dean Busby to share more on our testing protocols. Dean Busby. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so last week we introduced uh, the requirements for our students. Uh, to return to housing uh, in the spring of 2021. Uh, and we will uh, go uh, more in depth uh, into each one of those uh, protocols and procedures, starting with the pre-arrival uh, prior to arriving to campus, uh, moving to the arrival to campus, and then also we'll talk about post-arrival once uh, the students have checked into housing. So pre-arrival, uh, all residents who are endeavoring to reside in campus housing in uh, the spring of 2021 must submit evidence of a negative COVID-19 test prior to their arrival in housing. Uh, an official medical document uh, dated between Wednesday, January 6th and Wednesday, January 13th uh, must be submitted via email uh, to the LUELT at langston.edu. This official medical document can be a JPEG or a PDF document. Uh, and it must uh, list your, uh, the student's name uh, and also note that it either demonstrates no presence or detection of the virus or simply a negative result. Uh, and we are not specifying uh, rather, you know, of course, regardless of which test you want uh, to take, it can be a PCR test or uh, a uh, rapid test. Uh, we are also asking that the students submit that information as it will be encrypted uh, and keeps us within uh, the HIPAA violations and it's secure. Uh, by sending that information to the LUELT uh, account from their Langston University email address as well. Once the student arrives on campus uh, in January of 2021, uh, they will be greeted again uh, at the south, uh, uh, south entrance uh, of the campus as they did in the fall uh, and through uh, authorized and medical certified uh, designees, we will administer uh, some some COVID testing for those students. And so returning students will have to complete uh, their uh, official housing application and also select a 15 minute time slot, uh, which of course will be an appointment uh, between 8 a.m. Uh, on January 15th and 6 p.m. on Wednesday, January 20th. Uh, students uh, and their two guests, we're still keeping in lines with the two guests uh, requirement uh, will arrive at the south gate uh, at their designated date and time. Early or late arrivals will be required to wait in a designated area until their official time slot or until a opening comes uh, available in a non-guaranteed opening, uh, of course, in the schedule. Students uh, will then be checked in. Uh, they'll be screened. Everybody in the car will be screened uh, and the vehicle will be screened uh, for temperature of 100.4 or more, and then be directed uh, along the historic cottage row uh, to spots that are designated for the testing to occur. The type of testing that we're using uh, will be the Binex Now COVID-19, which is a rapid test, uh, which again will be authorized uh, and medically uh, uh, administered uh, by certified designees of the emergency leadership team, uh, and they will test each student. We're only testing the students. We're not testing anybody else in the vehicle, only the student. Uh, 
And then after approximately 15 minutes or so, uh, the test results will be delivered to the students and privately shared with the members of the ELT. And from that point, uh, the student will then uh, either receive further guidance or they will be uh, approved to move forward uh, to housing for their key. At this time, I wanna turn it over to Chief to talk about the post-arrival test requirement and protocols for our students. Thank you, thank you, Dean. And good afternoon and welcome everyone. So as you heard, Dean uh, Snape, or Busby gave you the pre-arrival uh, requirements for COVID-19. So now I'll share with you the post-arrival COVID-19 uh, testing requirements. So after arriving on campus and prior to Monday, February 1st of 2021, all campus residents must secure an additional negative COVID-19 test result. The location and, and schedule for this testing will be released um, as soon as all logistics are final. This multi-layered -layer, approach to testing during our spring 21 semester um, is designed to isolate, contain, and mitigate the risk of COVID-19. This strategy will create uh, the safest possible situation as we begin the spring term, and it also allows the possible path um, to a healthy campus and academic success for our students and stakeholders. For employees, um, employees of Langston and, and Langston University are encouraged to utilize one of the following options in the spring 21 semester to mitigate the risk of, of COVID-19 as we return to campus. First, uh, seek a COVID-19 test from your primary care provider in five days before returning to campus. Secondly, uh, schedule a university administered and provide a COVID-19 test during the week of January 11th to January 15th. Or third, also um, adhere to a voluntary self-quarantine uh, from January 1st to January 10th in preparation for a return to campus. This is not a requirement, it's simply a recommendation. Um, we are currently in the flu season and the COVID-19s across the state and nation continues to rise. We just want you to be mindful and cognizant of your health over the holiday break as we travel um, to spend times with our time with our friends and family. And we want to have a safe and healthy return back for our spring 21 semester. Now I'll turn it over to Dean Snavely as he will share with you um, the ClearSpan communicator application. Dean. Thanks, Chief. I did want to stress um, one piece there just on both the arrival and the post-arrival testing that all of that will be at no cost to either student or employee. So all of the testing that occurs um, in that January 15 to January 20th timeframe, as well as all the testing that occurs up until February 1st, and then the, the weekly testing throughout the rest of the spring semester, um, that will not be at a cost to the employee so uh, or the student. That's an important uh, piece that we felt was really important as we rolled out this uh, layered approach that both Chief Holland and Mrs. Powell outlined. Okay, so totally shifting gears for a second. Uh, we've talked about testing and plans. I want to talk about an exciting um, new technology that we are in the process of rolling out. As many of you know, uh, Langston was using basically carrier pigeons for our phone system for the last uh, 10 years or so, and um, often difficult for us to get in touch with each other. Uh, Dr. Smith and uh, the university's administrative council and the ELT pushed for an investment in our phone system over the last several months. And that's finally coming to fruition thanks to the hard work of members of the ELT and ITS, Mr. Moncrief, Keith Hodges, our a and CIO. And we're, we're putting the finishing touches on our new at and hosted voice solution, which is an all digital cloud-based platform that allows us to um, do all kinds of new things from a user perspective. One of, the one, one of the really exciting components that we wanted to highlight here that we started 
doing training on last week is what's called the ClearSpan Communicator application. So in addition to everyone having a user-based system in their office, uh, just like we had before, hopefully working better, we're still working out some of those minor glitches. Um, but in addition to that, we now have the ability for everyone to download this, what's called a soft client, essentially a software-based phone, either to a desktop computer, a laptop computer, a tablet, or your own mobile device. So this app, this ClearSpan app, uh, can now be used to make and receive uh, calls from your office line. So, so many of us who, um, you know, not only travel, but telework or, um, you know, for any number of reasons from pre-COVID and post-COVID, where we might not be in the office, the ClearSpan Communicator app will allow us to better serve our students and all stakeholders uh, through this new technology. So we wanted to walk through here today, at least the steps for downloading and using the ClearSpan app on your mobile device. Um, and uh, those steps are listed here. Um, many, if not all of you, likely got a, an email um, links and employees from the LUELT outlining these steps. We'll be sending more messaging. You're welcome to send questions to the LUELT as well. But here's the five simple steps. It's just like downloading any other app on your phone. It's very similar if you've used WhatsApp or Facebook, some of the other communicator applications, um, the ClearSpan app, you just type in the search bar in, in um, either Apple or in Google Play Store, ClearSpan Mobile, and it will come up. And one of the first things that you do after you've downloaded and accepted the terms, um, it will trigger um, you entering a server address um, or a URL. And that's there in step three. Uh, one of the advantages of this app is that if you're making and receiving calls from the app and not from your cell phone, um, uh, persons you are calling or that you're receiving calls from would only see your office number. Um, they wouldn't have access to your mobile device or your mobile number, which is a, a positive in today's world when we make and receive so many calls from so many different numbers. And so people can know to always get you at your office number no matter where you are. So that third step is entering that uh, URL, that address there into the app, not into just a browser like Google Chrome or Safari. You have to enter this in the app. And once you do that, the next step is there to enter credentials. And for Langston employees, your credentials are first your username, which is your Langston University official telephone number. Um, so there's a sample number here. Don't input that, input your number. Uh, followed by at langston.edu. That's your username for both the mobile app and a desktop version of the application. And then the default password before you change it to something much more difficult and much more sophisticated is that Langston with uh, the A as an at and the O as a zero. And then from there, it, it will download the first screen you'll see is really the call log from your office line in the upper left hand corner is how you access settings. It's a little three lines that almost look like a little flag and where you can get into all the settings. We'll be doing a series of trainings on the communicator app. We did some on Friday. We'll be doing, I believe it's three more trainings this coming Wednesday, the 16th. So look for your email um, to sign up for one of those or send us an email at luelt at langston.edu. And we're just excited to use this new technology with you. We think it will make um, be easier for our faculty and staff to utilize our phone system and improve customer service for our students and all of the stakeholders of the Langston community. So let us know if you have questions. We'll take more in the Q&A section here in just a minute. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jackson to remind us of some key dates coming up. Thanks, Dean Snavely. As I did last week, I'd like to review some, as you said, important dates. First, our grades are due today at five o'clock, so just in a few short hours. 
uh, at our last report, which came in at about three o'clock, uh, there were only about 14% of the grades that were still outstanding. So I'd like to pause and say a special thank you to all of our faculty members who worked so hard to get the grades submitted on time. And we have a couple of more hours, but let's get those grades in by five o'clock if you're still working on them. Our final faculty meeting of the fall semester will be held tomorrow morning, Tuesday, December 15th at 10 o'clock a.m. via Zoom. You should have already received a reminder from the Office of Public Relations. And this Friday, December 18th, the university closes at five o'clock for our much deserved holiday break. The university will remain closed through Monday, January 4th, 2021, when the university will reopen at eight o'clock a.m. It's important to note that all employees will be teleworking that first week, January 4th through the 8th. For students who plan to reside on campus, January 13th is the deadline for those students who submit their COVID-19 test results to the ELT as was discussed earlier in this webinar. A faculty institute will be held on Thursday, January 14th via Zoom. January 15th, that Friday is the beginning of student move-in for the spring semester. Monday, January 18th is the observance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So office, so uh, the university will observe MLK Day. And Tuesday, January 19th is also reserved for uh, part two of Faculty Institute if needed. That will be a half day session if needed. Spring move-in actually ends on Wednesday, January 20th with classes beginning the next day, January 21st. The first week of classes will be held remotely. And then once again, rather than the traditional week long spring break, the university will observe a mid-semester break on Thursday, March 18th and Friday, March 19th. Please note that for these two days, the university will be closed. So with that, we'll pause and open the floor for any questions that you may have. Feel free to type them in the chat or in the Q and A. So we have one question. Dean Snavely, would you take this one? Is there enough space to attend the MyTel training more than one time? Uh, you may want to learn more about the desktop and the app. Great question. Thanks, Dr. Jackson. And I just put in the chat, um, there are three trainings on the Communicator product this coming Wednesday, December 16th one at 10 a.m., one at 1 p.m., and one at 2 p.m. Um, and you can, there's plenty of room. Those are all done via Zoom. So there's no limit on the number of employees or stakeholders that can participate. So uh, just send an email to l-u-e-l-t at langston.edu to register for one of those sessions. Thank you. We have another question uh, from a student. Is there an update on the spring 2021 commencement or graduation recognition? Mrs. Powell, would you like to take that one? Um, certainly, there's, there's no update as of yet. Um, we're certainly going to be shifting our focus to that in the coming weeks as we uh, prepare for the spring 2021 semester. But uh, to my knowledge, there's not been any decision made as to um, how that ceremony will, will operate. We're, we'll be shifting our decision-making to that very soon. But as of now, there's no update to provide. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, Dean Snavely. Are there any suggestions for getting an error message that says server address is not valid host when using Mitel on the cell phone? Yeah, that's a common um, occurrence. So I would recommend, first of all, to um, close the app and try to reopen it. I know that's sort of the common tech advice always is like, turn off your computer and turn it back on. Um, but that clears um, something called your cache memory, which often, often creates server related uh, connection issues. So that'd be my first step. And then um, I see the person who's asked it and I will make sure and connect you with, um, with, with the person at Mitel and our internal ITS uh, this is a new thing for us, so um, it's working well for many people, but occasionally we get a couple errors here and there, and uh, so happy to, to help facilitate that. So first, uh, try to um, uh, restart the app um, and um, make sure you're putting in the right um, URL from that email and happy to send that again and I can post it here. Uh, I'll type it out. Sometimes the forwards and backslashes get missed. Sometimes the secure uh, line of um, internet code, which is HTTPS and not just HTTP gets missed. So just really double check those characters and then we can troubleshoot individually if you're still having issues. Just, I know, oh, unrelated back on testing, I wanted to just stress because we'd gotten a couple of emails come in during the webinar around COVID-19 testing for employees, uh, and faculty and staff of, of Langston. I just wanted to reiterate, we are not requiring um, every member of the community be testing, be tested prior to returning to campus, but we're strongly encouraging it and um, you know, providing that as a free service to employees uh, as one of those layers of mitigation and, and strategy. So not required. Um, so if, if you can't get in to see your primary care physician in those first couple of weeks, that's a difficult thing um, to do. Don't worry, it's not required. You can always, um, you know, implement a different measure, um, you know, Sort of that voluntary quarantine. We're offering those tests. You can work with your supervisor on a plan that keeps you isolated and rotating. So just if you're having questions around that, certainly ask ELT, but also reach out to your supervisor about how they're planning to um, utilize you in, in your various office or department. And in, in addition to what Dean stated, uh, for our students, students are required. You do have to, to submit that information as specified. Uh, and so relative to testing availability, if you can't go to your primary care physician, uh, there are several different options uh, throughout the community. You can go to CVS, Walgreens. Uh, you can go to your local um, um, health department, county health department uh, as well. And so you can also go to the Oklahoma State Department of Health. Uh, and get uh, some some list of testing, um, um, you know, testing availability uh, locations as well. And so there's a lot of locations that will offer free testing now. It's a lot more widespread testing, but for students, students who are on, and I thank you for those students that are here, it is required for you in order to return uh, to housing. And so, you know, again, if you don't have insurance, the local county uh, health department and some of those, uh, those are the free. You don't have to have health insurance for those. So I would say reach out to your local county health department. Uh, and if you need any additional uh, assistance, feel free, as Dean Snavely stated, to reach out to the ELT uh, and, and we can, can work to provide some, some type of resource uh, to help you. Thank you. And that will be Dean all great points um, that will be a, a part of that revised plan that comes out at the beginning of the year is um, different sources, resources, and partnerships that we've developed um, for both uh, students and our employees uh, to, to face some of those challenges that, that 
that they may face and you know, the best way to navigate that. I see yeah. there's a, oh, go ahead, Dr. Jackson, sorry. Yeah, no, I think we were looking at the same thing. We have a question about contact tracing, Dean. Um, will the departments be contacted if a student or another individual uh, tests positive and has been in a particular department? What's the notification process? So that, that is a part of our um, contact tracing process. That's one of the questions that's asked. Uh, and if there's any definitive information, once we define what um, close contact is defined by the CDC, uh, if there's any individuals in the office or in the area, uh, rather it be a student or a faculty or staff member uh, that has been in that space, uh, we do follow up with the individuals in that department, but we only do that uh, based off the information that is transmitted via our contact tracing interview. Thanks for that question. Thanks, Dean. I don't see any additional questions in the chat or in the Q&A, so thank you all who um, posed questions. As always, if questions come up later, feel free to email L-U-E-L-T at langston.edu and visit our COVID-19 resource page found on the university website. So we've come to the point of our weekly rep webinar where we reflect on resilience. This week, we would like to congratulate the fall 2020 graduates, particularly of our School of Nursing and Health Profession. Our nursing graduates are ready to serve amid a pandemic. Thursday and Friday of last week, the School of Nursing and Health Professions held its pinning ceremonies for recent graduates in Tulsa and Ardmore, respectively. I'd like to say a special thanks to Dean Hunter and our entire faculty and staff within the School of Nursing. A special shout out to our colleagues at the Ardmore site who were able to plan a socially distant pinning ceremony. You'll see some quick screenshots uh, pictured there. The students were socially dis the graduates were socially distanced in different rooms. They were pinned while their families and friends and supporters all celebrated with them via Zoom. Um, Tulsa celebrated completely virtual. And again, we had guests from across the country and beyond who were able to join and celebrate. The pinning ceremony for the School of Nursing signifies completion of the Bachelor of Science in Nursing in a time where our nurses are needed more than ever. Uh, between our two sites, Tulsa and Ardmore, uh, we have 29 new nurses who are poised and ready to make a difference uh, in a time where healthcare workers are needed more than ever. Uh, one of our graduates from the Tulsa program, Gabrielle Payne, was even featured along with the other graduates of the Tulsa program on Tulsa News 6. Uh, and so we're really happy to see that additional um, recognition of our graduates. So we'd like to say congratulations to the newest nurses and graduates of our BSN program. And congratulations to all fall 2020 graduates. You made it, and we are so very proud of each of you. So we invite you to join us for our next webinar, which will be held next year, January 4th, 2021. We hope that you have a safe and enjoyable restful holiday break. And as always in closing, take care lions. <laughs>